1 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> this chapter, as some of us have been through it a few times, is a chapter that discusses church discipline. And um, it's a really important thing for us to keep in mind and um, to make sure it's a responsibility of the church to make sure that this happens. And as we get in here, we'll see, we'll see why. And um, so we'll get started here. Now, we just got done with talking in the first four chapters discussing an issue that Paul started out this letter with. Um, and um, he just finished rebuking them, how they allowed division to creep in the church. And now in chapter 5, he's dealing with their failure to discipline and the moral brother. And in chapter 4, we talked about the issue of pride, and that these believers were filled with pride. And pride is the opposite of love. It's because pride's concerned with self. And always focused on their own, the, own, the concern of self. Whereas love responds and is concerned in response to the needs of others. So when we see this church, we can kind of see that, we can see that pride. And what happened with the pride in, in the Corinthian church, as we've seen, it produced not only disunity because they weren't unified, right? You had four different divisions, actually, and the back, bickering back and forth And when we we're in chapter one. But the indifference and unwillingness to exercise church discipline has, has made a bigger problem. So as we get into chapter five, we'll see what's, we'll see what's going on. So chapter 5, verse 1 says that it's actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. You're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in the body but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present. I've already judged him, who had done, who has so done his deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So here's a guy in the church having an incestuous affair with his stepmother. And not only is this prohibited in the Old Testament, but it was also prohibited by Roman law. We think about the Romans and how they were, and you're like, really? <laughs> it was a little shocking, right, to hear that. But they didn't even allow that. So you notice Paul says nothing about the woman. He's talking about this guy, right? Right? He's talking about that guy's sin, not the stepmother's sin. So that would probably suggest that she wasn't a believer because Paul's not going to discipline. It's not, it's not his area. It's not his responsibility. So you look into, into verse 2, and it says, And you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he who has done this deed might be taken away from you. This affair must not have bothered the church at all. If they didn't do anything to bring him to repentance, it was going on. There's no accountability. And it should have broken their hearts. And that should have led them to discipline. And that discipline should have brought him to repentance or at least have the opportunity to repent. Because when, we, when you go through that discipline, it's not meant <clears throat> as to be a negative thing. It's, it's in love 
always looking for restoration. That's our job, always looking for restoration, always looking to, to come back to Christ, always coming, looking to be cleansed and renewed, not to be beaten, right? So we look at in Matthew 18, 15 through 17, because in that discipline, you're to put them out of the fellowship, right? That's what delivered one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. It's like, get him out. So let's go to Matthew chapter 18, because I think it's important that we see these and understand them, because the application is not only for the church body, but for our own lives. Matthew chapter 18, 15 to 17. It says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Can't argue over what he has to say. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. And they excluded them from the fellowship, right? So the purpose for discipline, like I said earlier, is to restore a brother or sister, not to punish them. If they don't listen and come to repentance, we must assume they're not a true believer or their heart is extremely hard and exclude them from the fellowship in the church. Paul's an apostle. <clears throat> he had the authority of Jesus Christ. And he already judged this man in verse 3 as if he were there with, with the Corinthian church. He instructed them with the power of the Holy Spirit the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they were to serve up church discipline at their next meeting. Look at chapter, or verse 4 and 5. It says, 4 says, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord Jesus. So he's telling them, when you get back together, you need to deal with this. They're, you're to remove him from the fellowship, delivering him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit might be saved on the day of the Lord Jesus. That statement right there is pretty controversial with a lot of different commentators, a lot of different people, theologians, people studying the word. And I'm going to give you a few things that are thrown out there. It said it may refer to physical judgments like sickness, even death. If this person is a true believer being sent out, sent out of the church, now they're out in the world, delivered unto Satan, would make them miserable and possibly bring them to repentance. You've got to think, there were no other churches in that area, right? Here's the church that Paul set up. So you put him out. It's not like today. You can go run to another church and hide, hang out, unless somebody comes and tells them what's going on. Or, you know, you've got all these options. Or you can find a church that will totally agree with you, and they don't really care what anybody has to say, right? They're tolerant. They're accepted, accepting. So he didn't, this, this guy didn't have that opportunity, right? This was the church, the true church. So the idea was that as you go out, <clears throat> delivered unto Satan, you're not under that covering. You don't have that fellowship. You don't have brothers and sisters praying for you. You don't have brothers and sisters to talk to and, and to, to edify you, right? So you're out there, and if you're a true Christian, you, you should feel pretty miserable, and your heart should that mis being miserable and 
and frustrated and and see your sin and come back to Christ and and repent. It will be out now being delivered to Satan. They be out from under God's protection. Be vulnerable to the attacks of Satan, who wants to bring about our death. Right? He doesn't want us possibly putting the word out there, possibly repenting and being back in fellowship. He's trying to destroy that team. And some believe that the power to deliver one to Satan was a special power given to the apostles and is no longer in existence today. In any case, we need to remember that discipline of believers is always to bring restoration and fellowship with Christ. Some believe that the offender is disciplined by the Lord in this life because of their sin that they have committed, but he is saved on the day of the Lord. Well, there's not a whole lot of thought about eternal judgment in that thought process. And it, you know, you think about you think about that belief system. You're thinking, okay, so here you just if you're preaching this that. This person can go out and do whatever it is they've been doing, and, and God's gonna, going to discipline them throughout their life so that it, at, the, at the end, they're saved, they're brought into the kingdom. I don't, I don't see how that lines up with Scripture, because if you're a child of king, a child of Christ, you will know you are my disciples by what? love, if you follow me, if you, if you do my commands, right? Well, none of that is involved in that thought process. I'd question salvation if there's no repentance throughout that lifetime. Not that I'm sitting there to judge because I don't know. I don't know their heart. I can't see their heart. Only God knows our hearts. We don't even really know our heart. But I know that in my life, if I sin, if I do something against God, my spirit mourns, right? Your heart aches. And I'm in that position, I'm in that, that misery until I get right and I repent and turn away from whatever that is. Because my desire is to, praise, is to please God. I know that's our desire. And I fail. I failed for a number of years in a big way. But God didn't allow me to stay there, right? Because I'd made that commitment. And he's like, he's really good about reminding us of the commitments that we make. He's a jealous God. Doesn't want any other gods before him. And he comes after his lost sheep, his wandering sheep. And he kept reminding me that I made a commitment and that I needed to uphold my end of the bargain. And then the day came where I totally gave in to his mercy and grace and said, listen, I surrender everything. Because we like to hold on to areas of our life. This is mine. You can have all the rest, but this is mine. And God will take you to that spot where he knocks on your door and says, you going to serve me? I can't have two masters. It can't be you and me. You know, we've heard a lot about Serving two masters, the devil and God is where our head goes to, right? But no, it could be you. But we know that if this person is truly a Christian, his heart is going to turn. That's why I think about people that I know that I know they got saved. I know they be. Man, it looked like they lived a Christian life. It looked like they had the fruits of the Spirit working in their life. And, and then they walk away. And you're like, and you know they're miserable because you can see it. And you're like, when are you going to come back? Because you are not your own. You were bought already. And you're going through a wake-up call, you know. And you see that change where they come back and it's just a, a beautiful blessing so 
when you think about our children, we think about our family members that have made commitments to Christ, we know that God finishes what he starts. And we know that one day they're going to turn. One day they're going to turn around. I know my parents prayed for years and years and years for me. <laughs> yeah, prayers have changed. <clears throat> but I know, I know they did, you know, because there were some rough times. There were some rough years for a long time. And each one of us kids went through that. They have, you know, some of us have kids that kind of stay on the path, right? And some of us have kids that just keep jumping off the tracks and then, jump, you know, bouncing back and forth. <clears throat> and, and mom and dad, they had to pray hard for four kids. And we had good examples growing up. You know, everybody lives in a dysfunctional home. But because we're people, we're human. But we had a good example. We had good examples in our family. And uh, we still choose to run our own lives. But when this kind of thing happens, when you've got someone that comes in and there's, there's blatant sin and they don't want to repent from it, we are to put them out. Put them out of the fellowship until they repent. We get into verse 6. It says, your glory is not good. They're glorying in themselves. You do not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. We just went through Passover, right? Glenn's ex done a great job explaining to us what Passover is all about and explaining the feast. And this verse is, is huge in our daily walk with Christ, as well as the church body, as we see here in this, in this chapter. There's a parallel. He says, your glorying is not good. It's not good. What does it do? It allows tolerance to manifest. Tolerance to sin. Because when you've got a group of people in the body that are boasting, like we started out, all right, I am, I am a follower of this guy, right? There's four different guys. They said they followed, and they were not unified. They were split. There was divisions in the church, tons of pride going on, <clears throat> which they learned from their culture, the old man, because in that area, in that day, remember everybody, who their superheroes were, philosophers, the, the intellectual people of their day. So they already had this going on. And that, is, that, was, that was enough sin, right? Well, then, in that glorying in themselves, that boasting, that pride, they become tolerant to sin. And a little leaven leavens the whole lump, it says, right? And leaven here is a picture of moral sin. And Paul's saying if you allow or tolerate one person's moral sin in the church, it will grow, and the whole church will be affected or infected. And they had allowed this to happen. They had tolerated this. So godly discipline in our church is, is, is crucial in order to maintain a godly character. Because who are we? Who are we in essence? Who is Christ coming back for? His bride, right? What's he want his bride to look like? And that white signifies what? Purity. Purity. So does he want to come back for a church that's tolerant to all this sin and is, is tarnished by all these different things going on? We look at our churches today and we see what this tolerance has done by not addressing situations and we see what's happened to some very good denominations. They started out really good. We've got a church over here in Wakeley that are no longer Methodist. 
they decided they voted and decided they were no longer going to be United Methodists. They're going to be a Bible church. So we're not following this because you've gotten away from the foundational um, doctrines of the faith. So we're not going to do that. We're not going to be a part of that anymore. And that's been happening more and more because they've allowed things to creep in. God's not coming back for that bride. He's coming back for a pure bride, right? So 5 7 says, Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you are truly are unleavened. Why are we unleavened? Because of Christ, his sacrifice for us. He says, Therefore, purge out that old leaven. He says, Clean your house so it can be made new again. You were made holy. And righteous and pure through Christ, our Passover lamb. As the yeast was removed from the house during Passover, sin is to remove, be removed from the house of the Lord, the local church, as well as our temple. There's our parallel. Not just the church, but ourselves. Sometimes we think we can get away with a little something, right? Well, that little something is that leaven, and it grows. Verse 8, therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Clean our lives out of the moral sins, malice and wickedness, and live a life of sincerity and truth. There is nothing more magnetic in a person's personality than sincerity and truthfulness. You meet someone that's sincere. There's a lot of things come with that. Humbleness, love, gratitude, faithfulness. It comes with those two words. And that in a person's personality is a magnet for people because we don't see it. It's shocking. Melinda and I, well, I'd met this guy some years ago at a Christian biker event, and, and I come home and I told Melinda, I said, man, you got to meet this dude. I said, he's probably the most humble person that I've ever met in my life. Most humble man I've ever met in my life. It's weird. Weird humble to me. You know, I've met a lot of humble people. You know, I'm not saying I haven't, but it was just something about it that was just like I'd never seen before. I said, I can't explain it to you because I don't know. I don't know what words I would use. So, not a perfect person by no means, but I'm a real humble dude. And so, I don't know, a year or so later, you got to meet him. And she's like, yeah, I get what you mean. <laughs> you just can't. And that's what God wants from us. I mean, that, that individual you want to hang out with. You know, because there's something about them that's like, you've got something that I know I need. And I know what it is. I know where to get it. You know, it's not like I don't know where to get it. But it's really, it's neat to be around. Because just, I don't know, the reactions of other people when you see them interacting, just the whole thing. So our focus needs to be our temple. We need to live a life of sincerity and truth. Verse 9, he said, Paul says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I did certainly not mean with sexually immoral people of this world or with the, the covetous, the extortioners, or idolaters, since you need to go out of this world. So we can't, we can't get away from them, right? But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what do I have to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. So Paul had written a letter earlier not to hang out with sexually immoral people. 
in the church applied it to those outside of the congregation. So they were hanging out with those people out here that aren't under, under the authority of the church. So they got it all messed up. So Paul was like, you can't do that. You wouldn't be able to live on this earth. But Paul was talking about someone who says, says that they're a believer, someone called brother, who's sexually immoral, covetous, an idolater, a reviler, drunkard, or, or extortioner. Don't even eat with these types of people. Why? There's that. Yeah. Yep. But by doing so, you're condoning their lifestyle. So if I got a brother that's immoral or any of these things, and we're just hanging out all the time, and it's not like I'm going over there and saying, hey, man, we need to talk and trying to bring him back to repentance, trying to plant that seed in his heart and in his mind. But we're just hanging out, doing whatever. What am I telling him? Yeah, you're all right. I accept you as you are for what you're doing. We can't do that. Not a brother. Now, someone that's unsaved, that's totally different. I can hang out with them. I build a relationship with them. Build that trust. Because that trust is important. If I trust someone, and tell me, tell me what you think. If I trust someone, I'm going to let, they can speak to me whatever is on their heart. Because we have a relationship. They've invested in my life. I've invested in their life. There's been, there's been a, a cost, right? I've got skin in the game. I didn't just walk up to them, never seen them before, pull out my Bible and start swinging. No, we've spent time together. I've invested in my life. I know them. They're not a stranger to me. So when they bring something to me, you know, and say, hey, you know, here's Jesus, I'm going to be receptive. I may not accept it, right, as as an unbeliever. I may not accept it right then. But I'll be like, hey, man, I get it. I know. I know where you're coming from. That's cool, bro. Thank you. Whatever. But, yeah, I'm not, not ready for that. But it's not... It's not an, they don't feel attacked. They don't feel ganged up on. They don't feel, you know, you're coming to them out of love and an investment. But as a brother, and they're in those lifestyles or doing whatever it is they're doing, totally different thing. Can't hang out, can't do that. Because I'm saying, hey, man, I know you're not where you need to be, and, I'm, you know, whatever. And I think... That's happened way too often in churches. Because we look at Jesus, you know, he ate with publicans and sinners, right? But they weren't professing disciples. They weren't disciples of Christ. And we need to have that separation from those living in rebellion to God because that's part of the repentant process, the repentance process. Road to repentance is that, hey, man, listen, I love you, but until this happens, we can't, I can't hang out and do that because I can't condone your lifestyle. Does it mean that we don't pray for them? Does it mean that we don't ever speak to them and encourage them to be, to, to repent and come back? Because that's our focus. Our focus is always to be <coughs> Restoration. Always restoration. 512. For what do I have to do with judging those who are on the outside? Do you judge those on the in- who are on the inside? Who are inside? Paul's like, I don't judge those unbelievers. That's not my job. Verse 13 says, but those who are on the outside, God judges. So that's God will judge the unbelievers. That's his job. Because like we said earlier, Paul didn't judge the woman involved. So she must have been on the outside. She must have been an unbeliever. <clears throat> he didn't really make mention of her except for this is what this dude did with this person. But Paul did judge the man on the inside. He 
said, put away from yourselves the evil person. That's some pretty strong words. God has given authority to the church to do this. Not only authority, but it's our responsibility to God. Because, like I said earlier, God's looking for a, a body, a spotless bride for a holy groom. So when someone's put out of the fellowship and it's announced to the church, it should be done with sorrow and humility. It should break our hearts. It's a painful thing. We should immediately get to prayer, go into prayer for restoration, for repentance. And it's, it's kind of a tough chapter, you know, that we just went through, but it's necessary. We all need to know the process. We all need to understand God's expectations of us, not just as a body, but as an individual. That, hey, man, this little, what you may call a little sin over here, not a big deal. What does it do? It grows. It festers. It becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And we need to guard against that. We need to battle that. And it's a battle every day. We all have to battle every day. We're human. We're not perfect. We have issues. I know I have issues, and I know some of you well enough to know you have issues, too. <laughs> it's one nice thing about a church that's got a lot of people that are close. Get into this age that we're in, deeper and deeper. We're going to have more and more issues like this come up, I believe. And those that do not follow what Paul said here in chapter 5, are going to be, first of all, they're accountable. And it's going to destroy their name. It's going to destroy their character. It's going to destroy the name of, of Christ when it comes to the, that denomination or that, that person or that title on the, on the outside of the building. We need to guard against that. We just give you thanks and praise and honor, Lord. Just thank you for your word. Thank you for the reminder tonight of how we should live our lives, Lord, how we should act as a body, how we should come together, Lord, and um, if we need to, discipline, Lord, and if we need to, come to a brother or a sister and, and confront them and say, hey, because we love them. And Lord, if we're that brother or sister, Lord, we just pray that <clears throat> our hearts will be softened and, and repent and come back to you and, and be restored. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for your word and, and for this act of restoration, because this is love. We just thank you, give you praise. In the precious name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, let's get together and... Uh